Hi everybody, Dr. Pingle here. This is uh, part two of our LiDAR lecture. And today we're gonna to be talking about LiDAR products and processing. Um, the idea behind this is that even though um, it's awesome that we can download uh, point clouds from the national map and other locations, um, many times we actually don't need to dig in that far. Um, the advantage to the point cloud is that it's a full, uh, well, a fairly full 3D uh, reconstruction of the environment as we talked about uh, because of the altitude that the plane flies um, it doesn't always capture the, the faces of buildings all that well, um, but generally speaking, it's quite good and it's it's a lot better than a lot of the things that uh, many of the many geographers are used to. So uh, it's uh, it's fairly fairly nice. Um, even so, uh, we don't always necessarily need that uh, for the project that we're working on. Um, maybe we want um, the products that are associated with uh, a point cloud. Um, so we're going to talk about two of those products today. Um, one is the DTM or the Digital Terrain Model. Uh, another is the uh, DSM or digital surface model. Um, we'll also talk about um, the digital canopy model or sometimes called the canopy height model, um, which is uh, sort of a, a combination of those two things. Um, why might we not wanna deal with the 3D point cloud? Um, it might be overkill for what we're working on. Um, so as a geovisualization expert, um, you know that sometimes things um, can be overwhelming to the user, um, sort of throwing the kitchen sink uh, out of visualization is not always the best plan. Um, we might very well want to strip that down and make things um, a little bit cleaner uh, and a little bit easier to see. And so um, rather than dealing with these points, um, which, you know, when you kind of look at them from far away, look fine. When you, when you zoom in on them, they often look very strange. Um, we probably will want to go with something a little simpler, uh, a 2D surface or a 3D mesh instead. And we'll talk about what those are. Um, there are tons of ways to process this data. Um, I'm going to show you some of the, the shortcuts, um, ways to get at some of the stuff um, very easily. Uh, in the notebooks that accompany the lecture, you'll learn a little bit about um, how to make some of these things yourself, and we'll talk about some of that stuff in lecture as well, too. So uh, with that, um, we will go ahead and get started. So the national map is one great source for LiDAR data. Um, you can often download um, Point clouds here, uh, not everywhere, but in a lot of places. Um, where uh, you can download these things, you can also download, um, uh, often anyway, uh, uh, DEMs, uh, digital elevation models that have been derived from LIDAR. So most of the time when we work with um, elevation data sets, we're working with a um, SRTM uh, uh, data. That stuff is distributed in um, one arc second or 30 meter um, resolution grid cells. Um, the national elevation data set is finer than that. Uh, that's a 10 meter spacing. Um, but um, there, are, um, there are some really nice um, products that, that you can get that come from LiDAR. Um, and in the future, probably a lot of the stuff is going to get jumbled up. Uh, but at the moment, um, if you download some of the stuff, uh, you can see here I clicked on elevation products uh, and there's a, a one meter DEM uh, available. Uh, again, not everywhere, uh, at least not on the national map. Um, but in a lot of places. And um, the one meter DEMs are available in quite a few more places than this um, if you look around at the local state uh, agencies. So this is an example of the, um, uh, the Virginia LIDAR uh, data set availability distributed through VGIN. Um, if you just Google um, Virginia LIDAR you'll, you'll, or VGIN LIDAR, uh, you'll get right here. Um, that's a web portal that you can, you can browse this stuff. Zoom in, click on one of these tiles, and a pop-up will come up. Last time we talked about ZLAST URL as being a way to download the point cloud data. Um, what you can download here uh, is the DEM URL, um, which is going to be um, a, uh, a digital terrain model, actually, that's created from the LiDAR data. Um, we'll take a look at that here in a second. Um, one, one little hitch here uh, is that when you click on that DEM URL, it's going to bring you to the... Um, it's going to bring you to an FTP download page, at least uh, as of this recording. Um, what you're going to want to do is look for this tile uh, over here. So if you just kind of do a, a quick browse, um, you will uh, you'll be able to find that stuff um, pretty easily. Uh, in many cases, you can also download um, break lines. Um, so you mentioned this briefly uh, in uh, the lecture on uh, terrain. Uh, keep in mind the digital elevation models are kind of a, a weird abstraction of the terrain. Um, we can, at each sort of x, y coordinate in the raster, we can only have one elevation value. 
Uh, and what that means is that, especially in the case of kind of um, coarser resolution DEMs, 30 meter, 90 meter DEMs, um, it's actually pretty hard to represent very steep slopes. So when you have things that are sort of highly discontinuous, um, those are often rendered uh, as sort of linear vector features um, with, a, with a break line file. Uh, and that sort of helps demarcate and then later sort of build models um, based off of terrain um, when, when again, there's these sort of sharp discontinuities. Um, that happens all the time, especially with water flow models, um, ditches, culverts, bridges, all of these things are sort of, uh, don't, don't get represented very well in DEMs. Um, better on LIDAR in some cases, uh, actually in some cases worse. Um, but, um, uh, but that's what those are for. Uh, if you just load one of the, uh, if you download one of those DEMs from VGen um, and feel free to pause the lecture and do that, uh, I think it's gonna make a lot more sense if you sort of play along here. Um, but, uh, but this is downloading one of those um, IMG files. So that's an AirDOS Imagine uh, raster file, a very nice format uh, for storing your raster data. Uh, not as much fun as GeoTIFFs, but, uh, but not too bad. Uh, anyway, um, uh, you, you tune in partly for the personal commentary, right? Um, anyway, uh, this is what that would look like if you drag it in there. Uh, the default color map is not spectacular. Um, in this case, um, it's applying sort of blue to yellow to red. Um, blue being, uh, in this case, kind of hard to tell. Uh, blue in this case being, uh, there we go, look at the legend, uh, being kind of lower lying areas, red being higher areas. Um, uh, and you can start to sort of see the shape of the land, sort of, um, but it's not great. It's not a really um, awesome representation. It's it's uh, it's it's okay. Um, and so we probably are going to want to um, visualize this in a different way. Um, so uh, a lot of the stuff we're going to talk about right here builds on the uh, terrain lecture uh, that we covered. Um, if you have time to kind of go back and look at your notes, if the stuff doesn't make sense, I'll try to explain it as well as I can as we go on here. But um, but this all builds about stuff uh, on stuff that we've already discovered or uh, covered. Um, by the way, uh, this is kind of interesting. Um, if you download stuff from the national map, most of that stuff is going to be registered in meters. Um, for all I know, that's a requirement for them. That would make sense. Uh, stuff you're going to download uh, more locally, and by locally, I mean here at the, the state level or the county level. Um, that could be Elevation units uh, for LIDAR could be um, either feet or meters. Uh, both are very common. Um, I wouldn't say one is even more common than the other. They're, they're both pretty common. Um, so do keep an eye out for that. Um, it's important to know the difference between those two. Um, just uh, just kind of know what you're looking at. Uh, and it's pull pretty easy to pull up the metadata uh, and just take a quick look. Uh, so one thing we can do to visualize this uh, land area is to just apply a simple hill shade. Um, so you've, uh, you've done this before in the terrain lecture um, and uh, simple map operation, this, this should be pretty old hat at this point. Um, if, you, if you are playing along and you did download a, a LiDAR DEM, um, then, uh, then feel free to apply a quick hill shade and you can sort of see what I'm talking about. Uh, again, this is an okay way to see the landscape. You can, you can definitely make out uh, features more easily than on the um, just sort of color ramped elevation model. Uh, pretty easy to see roads. You can see building footprints. You can see lots of sort of interesting structures here. Um, uh, but there are other ways you can do it. So one thing you can do is you can apply a multi-directional hill shade. Um, this is a really nice way. Um, again, probably better than the, than the standard hill shade for reasons that we had talked about already. Um, one of those being uh, that uh, it tends to uh, represent the shading more evenly, uh, whereas a hill shade, since it's sort of uh, illuminated only from a, a single point source, um, it has the it, it can be sometimes difficult to tell what's a ridge and what's a valley. Um, that's uh, generally clearer uh, in a multi-directional hill shade. Uh, the other nice thing is that it has this sort of white background. Um, so if you're going to overlay or draw things on top of it, uh, that's that's just quite a bit nicer than uh, if it's that that kind of ugly-ish gray color on a hill shade. However, uh, there are other ways to do it. Uh, I am a big proponent of using slope shading for this stuff. Um, I think it brings out a lot of interesting detail, sometimes too much detail. Um, so things can start to look a little confusing. 
Uh, on the other hand, uh, I think the roads pop out a little bit better, um, uh, but really it's sort of application specific. Uh, and there's some idiosyncrasy here. Uh, some people like one, some people like the other. Um, there, there's sort of uh, room to prefer uh, different things. Um, but, uh, but even applying something like a, a vertical exaggeration using the Z factor that we talked about on a multi-directional hill shade um, can often make uh, more subtle features pop out really nicely. Uh, what we're looking at here is uh, it is a DEM, right? Uh, it's, a, it's a raster of elevation. Uh, it's certainly digital, so it is a digital elevation model. Um, the kind of DEM that we're specifically looking at is called the DTM, or a digital terrain model. Um, in the past, there was really not much distinction between a DTM and a DEM. Um, we just imagined that everything that we were looking at was the ground, uh, because what we were looking at was so coarse that things like houses and buildings um, would only, in very exceptional cases with very large buildings, um, start to show up there. Um, DTM is also known as the bare earth model, um, so you'll sometimes see it referred to that way. Um, bare earth implying that we've sort of stripped off everything that's um, on the surface, not just buildings, but vegetation as well. Uh, and what we're looking at is sort of a, the hard pack ground uh, that's underneath, um, underneath it all. Um, it's what we would imagine the surface would look like with all of that stuff um, removed. Um, it's, it's a little weird to look at these things. Um, you can see that, that there's a lot of um, artifacting going on here. Um, it seems like the kind of thing that would be conceptually easy to just sort of strip that stuff off, um, but all of that stuff imprints into the landscape in kind of interesting ways. And so reconstructing a world where all of that stuff has been just like scooped off the face of the earth is a little bit weird. Um, and, uh, and so that's why, that's why these things end up looking kind of strange. Uh, the more you get a chance to work with these, the more that will make sense to you. Uh, how are these things made? Well, what we do is we uh, we rasterize the surface. We take those uh, individual points uh, in the point cloud uh, and we turn that into a raster model. Um, there are lots of ways that you can do that. Um, the the two that we um, the one that I want to talk about right now uh, is where we find the maximum value within each grid cell. Uh, and we keep that and we, we sort of assign that to the value of the grid cell. Um, so this will make what's called a digital surface model or DSM. Uh, this is sort of a rasterized version of uh, everything going on on the surface. Um, this is also kind of an interesting abstraction. Um, so we're throwing away all of, the, all of the stuff that's sort of happening underneath. Uh, sort of a good example of where this goes wrong uh, like a house ends up looking okay because it doesn't have uh, a lot of overhang necessarily, uh, but many buildings are more complicated than that, and so um, those will look weird under this representation. Um, trees in particular look strange uh, because there's no, uh, again, we're sort of using a raster model, only one elevation value is recorded at each grid point, and so uh, you don't get that sort of classic tree shape where it kind of bends down and then goes to the trunk. Uh, all of that's gone. So all you get is sort of just a, a dome feature um, at the top. Um, so it looks a little bit weird. Um, and we'll see some examples of that here in a second. Uh, this is an example of what that DSM looks like for Blacksburg. Um, it's quite a bit more interesting than the DSM, or sorry, the DTM. Um, uh, the buildings pop out in kind of an interesting way. You can still see the color is still sort of uh, sort of well representing the shape of the land. You can kind of make, make out trees as kind of the, as, as these sort of features. Um, it's a lot more interesting and a lot more informative. Um, and yet uh, it's still uh, better probably to look at this stuff um, using other techniques. So uh, this is one of my favorites. Um, I ho hopefully you're playing along and you can do this one. Uh, this is essentially calculating slope, uh, applying a vertical exaggeration to it uh, using that Z offset value. Um, and uh, just sort of accepting the, the default um, color ramp. Uh, so instead of going um, uh, black to, instead of going white to black, uh, where black where steeper slopes are, are black, uh, we actually have the, the, the reverse. Um, I love this visualization. Um, uh, may, it may not be too useful, but, uh, but it kind of looks like an interesting x-ray of the environment, uh, and I really, really like it. 
Uh, you can do lots of fun things. You can apply a plasma color ramp to the same thing. Uh, again, I think this looks awesome, sort of predator vision, if any of you have even seen that movie. Um, uh, fun, fun way to sort of um, see the environment. Different, different ways, different perspectives, and I think that's uh, part of the fun of this stuff. Uh, this is a more classic view. Uh, this is darker, is more slope shading, um, sort of what we're used to seeing. I think it makes a really nice um, background for a lot of other things. Uh, to me, uh, buildings and the environment make a lot of sense under this. Uh, that's not true for everybody. Uh, if you find yourself sort of not digging this, that, that's okay. You're in a solid minority of people. Um, but, uh, but I really like this, especially as a base map. Um, most of the land renders as kind of, a, a kind of white. Uh, building edges are usually pretty crisp. Um, the trees kind of look like an artist sketched them, uh, in my opinion. Um, just kind of an interesting, neat way of, uh, of seeing this stuff. There's an example of a polygon overlay um, with, uh, with sort of semi-transparency. Uh, again, really, uh, really easy to, um, to mark this stuff. Uh, there's uh, a, a big version uh, of a sort of a mosaic of a couple of different LiDAR tiles for the Blacksburg area. Um, you'll get a chance to play with a section of this uh, in the notebooks. Um, I did a, a version of this kind of back in the day for uh, Cook County. Um, I think it's still up online. Uh, if you are interested in checking out what this looks like for a really large area, this is kind of one of the bigger projects that I did several years ago. Um, so feel free to um, visit this link, zoom in and out. Um, you're looking for um, kind of on the lower right here. Uh, sorry, that went away. And the lower right there, there's the thing that says, um, I can't remember whether it says PSSM or bone map, um, but, uh, but that's mine. Um, this, was a, this was a fun project. Um, so I did a postdoc several years ago, many years ago now, um, where we were looking at LiDAR data. And uh, I found myself needing to sort of make sense of this stuff. And the quickest and easiest way to do that for me um, was to just apply a quick slope filter on it. Um, I was actually not working in uh, ArcGIS at the time. I was working in MATLAB. Uh, and it was really easy to just sort of apply a gradient function um, to it and, and just and just get a look at it. Um, and that kind of evolved into this project um, where I started to really kind of think about how LiDAR data is visualized. Um, and so I kind of came up with this technique uh, called the perceptually shaded slope map. Um, the idea here is that um, you take a point cloud, you bin it to the maximum value, you create this DSM, you exaggerate the slope, uh, and then you um, ba basically visualize this on sort of a, a semi-gray tone um, uh, visualization. Again, I really like this. I think that it looks sort of sort of like hand-drawn. Um, you know, for, for a computer to represent uh, a hand-drawn-like appearance of, you know, essentially very complex point cloud data for very little computa computational cost, I think is, uh, is very, really useful. Um, I think it's most useful in places that are sort of this mixed urban environment. Um, it's a little less useful for things like in, you know, natural terrain stuff, um, but still really, um, really, really uh, helpful visualization of, uh, of LiDAR data in my opinion. Uh, this is an example of what that looks like on a really high resolution um, DSM. So uh, many of the many of the DSMs that you will work with are um, they're essentially a function of the how good the, the LiDAR point cloud was. Uh, a really dense LiDAR point cloud could have, um, you know, a really dense LiDAR point cloud might have 100 points per square meter. Uh, more commonly, you're going to be in the range of sort of 5 to 10. Um, uh, but, when you, but when you do fly a really detailed instrument, uh, a really good instrument, or a low altitude, or really slow, you can really image environments in, in amazing detail. Um, so this is an example of a DSM uh, that I got uh, of, uh, of Berkeley, California. Um, and uh, the, the LiDAR point cloud was so dense that we were able to make a five centimeter DSM of it and render it. And uh, I just think that it looks really, I just really like the look of this stuff. So uh, if you find yourself not liking the one meter stuff, um, don't, uh, don't, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Uh, you may, uh, some of it may look better at higher resolution. Um, PSMs are based on the idea of cognitive slope. Um, so uh, this was itself based on an idea of cognitive distance. Uh, and the idea of cognitive distance is that sort of people make these 
interesting biased errors when they try to make judgments. So it's not like, um, it isn't as if if you uh, are trying to guess how far it is from here to uh, the grocery store that you're wrong. Uh, obviously nobody, nobody knows uh, exactly how far that is in you know, perfect precision. Um, but, uh, but you make these sort of systematic errors. And, and with slope, this manifests in a way that people misjudge slope um, positively, or they exaggerate slope, or they think it's greater than it actually is on a very consistent basis. So if you go outside and, and you and you're you know walking up a hill, and you say how how steep is this hill? You make a guess. You say ah, it feels like it's 10 degrees. Well, you're likely to be off by a factor of two, um, which is kind of awesome. Uh, so uh, the I, I did a kind of a reanalysis of this um, based on some published data. Uh, by Profit et al. in 1995, and some subsequent analysis of Durgan et al. Um, and I find that this effect is quite consistent, actually, um, that people tend to exaggerate slope on a local level uh, by a factor of about 2.3 times. Um, and so I kind of I kind of use this as my magic number when I'm trying to apply a vertical exaggeration to uh, a LiDAR data set or um, some other kind of local data set. I'll often kind of crank up the vertical exaggeration by that amount. Uh, and that seems to be what most people find real-ish. Um, if you think back to some of the uh, behavioral uh, cartography stuff that we talked about earlier, um, you know, if you're if you're making a, a, a graduated or, or a proportional circle map of populations of cities, um, if you know that people are going to sort of underestimate uh, the area, then you can increase that area so that their judgments are accurate. You can sort of fiddle with the symbolization um, to actually make their judgments more accurate than, than they would be if there were a perfect one-to-one -one correspondence between phenomenon and symbol. So that's kind of what we do um, with, uh, with slope, and that's where this idea of perceptually shaded slope map comes from. Um, we're trying to accommodate um, the way that people sort of experience their environment and, and use symbolization to kind of mimic that effect. Um, as a geovisualization class, I think it's kind of fun to talk about the mechanics of why that works or how we know that works. Um, so this was a study that I ran uh, many years ago now. Um, and the idea is um, that given uh, sort of a five different renderings of the landscape, um, which of them allows uh, a, a, a participant in a, in a research study um, the easiest ability to um, either um, perform a mental rotation uh, on the image or to estimate what the profile um, would be if we kind of drew a, a line across. Um, so we'll look at that here in a second. Okay, so the mental rotation part works something like this. Um, given these two uh, sort of circular cutouts of the same location, um, could I rotate one to get the other or would I also have to reflect the image to make it match? Now, the way that you solve this problem uh, as a human is you sort of look for points that match on this image, right? So your eye is sort of looking for uh, salient parts of the image and you, you kind of look back and forth and back and forth. And at some point, when you do enough feature matching, your brain is able to say, ah, oh, that's a reflection. Um, you can't just rotate that one. You'd have to reflect it. Uh, and you hit the button uh, and I record whether that's true or false, and uh, whether uh, whether you're right or wrong, or and, and how long it took you to make that judgment. And so the idea here is that the better the image, the more quickly you should be able to perform this task because you're more easily able to sort of pick out key points uh, on each uh, of the images. So that's, uh, that's one task. Um, when you run the statistics on this, you get something that looks like this. Um, so we tested these on a number of visualizations, but just to kind of keep things clean and clear, um, this is how well my visualization compared to sort of a standard, <coughs> excuse me, a standard hill shade. Um, if we um, draw ellipses around kind of the, um, let's see, was the standard error, standard deviation, um, around sort of the, the, the ballparks of what they, um, what they would answer, uh, you get a result that looks like this. Um, so uh, within the PSSM, uh, people would answer these things about 79% uh, with about 79% accuracy. Within the hillshade, they would answer those with about 76% accuracy. That's not a huge improvement, uh, 3%, uh, but it is a statistically significant improvement. 
um, this is uh, this is enough uh, to sort of um, make the case that the PSM is is actually producing a positive effect, and, and the differences between the two uh, are not simply due just to chance. Um, while accuracy was better for the PSSM, response time uh, was not statistically significantly better. Uh, it was better, so if you kind of look at where the average is, I'm not sure why the uh, why the uh, uh, axes labels are cut off here, but um, the PSSM is just a little bit to the left of the hill shade, meaning people were able to answer those a little bit more quickly. Um, but because the, uh, the there's essentially some overlap between these two, uh, and basically that's evidence that that while PSSM is faster, uh, it could have just been due to chance. Um, so we can't exclude the possibility that that the differences that we see are just sort of chance based. Uh, this was the second task. The idea here is if I drew a line uh, from left to right across this image, uh, and I show you three alternatives, could you pick out for me which of these uh, alternatives matches um, the true profile. Uh, so it, you kind of move your eye across left to right. Um, how what what do you what do you hit as you do that, um, and which which of these matches up, right? So um, as you're as you're following along here, let me get my uh, digital pen. Uh, as you're following along here, uh, you go. Oh, I'm moving across. Maybe I clip this building. Which of these sort of has a has a has a clip here? Well, that's a little bit hard to say. Uh, could be red, could be this green. As you move across, you sort of hit, well, that looks like a house or something. Which of these sort of has something there? And then you say, ah, that's, that's probably matching this. Uh, then things get sort of flat for a while and you hit another building and uh, maybe this building right here corresponds to that building there. And how, uh, and so you would, you would sort of click on, on that line. Uh, and the computer would record your choice. I clicked on the green line. Was that right or wrong? How long did it take me to do that? Uh, when you do that, you get a result that looks something like this. Um, so uh, the PSSM uh, was, uh, people were able to answer this one more accurately uh, than with the Hillshade, but it wasn't statistically significant. So that p-value is not less than 0.05. Uh, these circles um, kind of top to bottom kind of overlap. Uh, you know, the, the, the ellipse for Hillshade extends, you know, above 71. The ellipse for PSSM extends below 71. There's some overlap there. That means that these are not sort of all that distinct. Uh, on the other hand, um, if you look at response time, uh, people answered the questions with the PSSM version of this um, about 13 and a quarter seconds. Uh, with Hillshade, that took them closer to 14 and a half. Um, those circles don't overlap. That's sort of this evidence that um, the PSSM is not only sort of empirically faster by about a second and a half, or about a second and a quarter, um, but that difference is unlikely to have been due just to chance. Um, <clears throat> there's There's been a lot of really interesting applications of LIDAR lately. Um, I, I would encourage you to, to Google these articles if you're interested. Um, the application of LIDAR to archaeology is just fascinating. Um, it's, it's, it's been revolutionizing uh, our understanding of a lot of different areas. Uh, and part of the reason for this is that we can sort of, you know, digitally peel off um, the, the, the trees and the landscape and sort of uh, see what's going on underneath without ever having to sort of um, send field workers out or disturb the area. Um, lots and lots of really cool stuff um, is visible here. So um, these articles are really easy to Google. So if you're if you're interested in this stuff, pause the video uh, and take a quick read. It'll only take you uh, take you a second. Um, <clears throat> just last year, um, new findings uh, were released to show uh, that many of the cities in Central America, um, these ancient Maya cities, um, were far far bigger and far more extensive um, than we ever really knew. <coughs> um, so this is one example, again, pause the video, read about this stuff, fascinating um, application of geography uh, and how it's, uh, how it's revolutionizing our understanding of these ancient civilizations. Um, I actually had a chance to work on some of this stuff myself. Um, this was several years ago, um, but uh, my, uh, um, my PhD advisor uh, had a friend who was an archeologist. She had some LIDAR data uh, and she wondered if we could sort of help out um, taking a look at this stuff. So we started poking through the data. Um, I used some of these visualization techniques that I had been working on. 
uh, in combination with a, with a filter to sort of strip off the vegetation. Uh, and um, we made some really interesting um, discoveries uh, about what was going on under the canopy. Uh, this is an area in Central America, in, uh, in Guatemala and Belize, um, that, uh, that's just incredibly dense. It's really hard to get through uh, on the ground. Uh, but flying this stuff in an airplane uh, with a LIDAR unit, uh, that LIDAR penetrates through the vegetation. It hits all of the stuff in between. Um, it's not stopped by that. You're actually getting these, again, as we talked about, multiple returns per, uh, per pulse. Uh, and so that means you're imaging all of this cool stuff. And, and the algorithms to sort of peel this vegetation back are, are really amazing. Um, it just lets you see this really neat stuff. So again, feel free to pause the video and, uh, and check that stuff out if you're interested. Uh, this is an idea of where that site is. Um, it's really right on the border of Guatemala and Belize. Uh, this is a, the site is called El Pilar. Um, and uh, archaeologists uh, led by Dr. Annabelle Ford have been going down here for the last couple of decades, um, really kind of enhancing our understanding uh, of, these different, uh, of these different sites and how they uh, were interrelated. Um, just to give you an idea of the, the power of these algorithms to sort of take this data apart, um, this is an example of a, a hill shade of the DSM uh, of the area uh, that we're looking at. Um, so this is the site around El Pilar. Um, what do you see? Um, you know, most of this, um, you probably, again, you're not looking at an aerial photo. Um, what you're seeing here is sort of the spatial signature of the trees and kind of all of this area over here uh, and over here on the right. Uh, all that's uh, just sort of dense, dense forest. Um, and you can probably also make out this road um, kind of moving through. Uh, this is the area uh, that's highlighted, uh, that's El Pilar itself. Uh, so if we zoom in there, uh, that's an example, just sort of a, a quick extraction, uh, again, of the DSM. But if we apply this, uh, this filter uh, called the simple morphological filter that I wrote, uh, we call it SMURF, uh, along with these PSSMs, uh, we called this technique in combination bone mapping. Uh, again, this is sort of the top view, but if we apply this technique, we can see through that canopy, uh, and this is what shows up underneath the canopy. Um, just a, 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 so easy to see these features. Uh, there's the main site of El Pilar. Uh, and um, the cool thing is, is that uh, we found this feature uh, right here. Uh, that previously unknown, uh, sitting right next to this main site, kind of right across this ravine, uh, undisturbed. Uh, and now uh, uh, Dr. Ford uh, and her team are kind of down there trying to figure out what this was. Um, really, really exciting stuff. Uh, this is a zoomed in view of the same thing. Um, this is, you know, we, I think we still don't know, quite know what this was for, um, whether it was used for agriculture, sort of these terraced landscapes, whether it was used for defense. Uh, for a little while, they were calling it the Citadel. Uh, it sort of looked like it might be some kind of a defensive structure. Um, I think uh, research for this is still ongoing. Um, we were by no means uh, the only people doing this. Um, lots of articles about this in the area. Um, this, is, uh, this is some amazing, amazing stuff. Um, if you wanted to sort of um, make these representations or uh, play around with the data in this way. Uh, again, my favorite way of sort of digesting point cloud data uh, is with cloud compare. Uh, it's not super easy to just, um, uh, all, all of these products are not just going to be downloadable from the national map. Uh, DTMs are, but DSMs usually aren't. Uh, and so if you want a DSM or if you want these sort of product, uh, products that are sort of more customized, um, you're going to have to make this stuff yourself. Um, so Cloud Compare can do some of it. Um, if you haven't downloaded this, it's free. Download it, grab a tile, uh, either from uh, the course website uh, or something else, and, uh, and feel free to just kind of um, play around with it and, and, and get your feet wet with LiDAR data. Um, <clears throat> really easy to bring in a DSM or a DTM uh, into ArcScene. Uh, so this is an example of a DSM um, brought into ArcScene again. So taking a, creating a raster um, and uh, recording the highest value and looking at it. Um, and this is actually one of the first ways that I experienced LiDAR data is this, what we call these meshes. Um, it, um, you can make stuff out, right? You can make out the drill fields. You can probably make out some of the buildings. It's not a, it's not a great way to visualize this. So um, we'll look at some other ways. 
Um, so uh, another good way um, of uh, looking at ground uh, or sort of looking at LiDAR products um, is to do uh, create a product called the canopy height model, um, sometimes called the digital canopy model, the DH, digital canopy, DCM. Um, I think these are used pretty interchangeably. Um, the idea here is, is we want to create sort of a, a normalized surface. Um, so if when you're looking at mapping variables, you need to normalize your variable by dividing by area, or dividing by population, um, uh, you, you, you may want to do kind of a similar technique here. So the idea here is if we look at the digital surface model, we're looking at both the terrain and what's going on, which is sometimes what you want to do. But sometimes what you want to do uh, is model what's going on on the ground um, and just assuming that the land were flat. So sort of artificially sort of if there are bumps in the landscape, sort of pulling those out and making those bumps go away and going flat. Um, so how do you how do you do that? It's actually quite easy. Um, and so we'll talk about the technique here. Uh, and the technique I should I should just mention here is, is used for more than just forests. Um, forestry LIDAR people were kind of the first to do it, um, but there are many, many applications of this beyond that. So um, you're going to need, uh, what are you going to need to do this? Um, you're going to need a, uh, a DTM. Uh, if you don't have that, you're going to need a LiDAR point cloud that either you've classified and found the ground points in it, or someone else has done that. Most of the stuff that you download these days uh, is going to be pre-classified for you. Um, so you don't necessarily have to do that step, although you, although you can. Um, in, the, in the case over here at the right, um, that, that classifier's job is to locate um, what the ground points are and can kind of compare elevations and sort of figure out. And so um, in the lower right hand image, you're seeing brown used to, to demarcate the, the places where um, the algorithm, the classification algorithm was pretty sure that what you're looking at here is ground. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about some more specifics here uh, in the future. Uh, but first thing, right off the bat, you need a DTM or you need to be able to make one. Um, you can actually create a DCM uh, using the raster calculator. So the raster calculator is one of these great like kind of Swiss Army knife tools. Uh, I use it fairly often for the processing that I do. Um, basically, all you need to do uh, is subtract the DTM from the DSM. Just get a DSM that you that you make from the data. Uh, you can make these in ARC, uh, you can make these in Cloud Compare, uh, and then from that you subtract the DTM. So this is an example of that. Uh, there's my DTM, there's my DSM. Uh, I can kind of look at those um, <clears throat> and see the differences. Uh, I've actually gone ahead and made sure that the um, color mapping for these is pretty commensurate. <clears throat> and this is an example of the digital canopy model there. Um, that digital canopy model uh, is really useful uh, because, again, we've taken out the effect of, of the terrain, and now all we're seeing is, um, is sort of the, the buildings on top of sort of an, a surface that we've sort of digitally leveled, um, if that makes sense. If that doesn't make sense, send me an email. We can talk about it. Um, so this is, this is kind of what that looks like. Um, Here we go. Um, we're looking at this here one more time. And there we're comparing the ground surface and the regular uh, 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 the, the DSM. And here's the digital canopy model again. We compare and swipe between these two. Digital canopy model is uh, here uh, and just looks blue because we've because we've artificially sort of leveled that terrain. Uh, one important application of this uh, is to create uh, polygonal building models from the LiDAR data. Um, once we've created a digital canopy model, we essentially know uh, how high each feature is off the ground, right? Whatever the ground elevation is, we throw that away, the ground is zero. Um, but now we've recorded how high that observation is above the ground. 
Uh, and that's particularly useful. You can use this to measure the height of trees or any other feature in the environment. Uh, but one really neat application of this is that you can use um, some tools to, to extrude buildings up. So if we have building, um, if we have building uh, footprints, which you can also get from Vigen. Uh, there's a new project out of Microsoft that distributes these. Um, it's not too hard to find sort of, uh, you, you can pull these down from OpenStreetMap. Uh, it's not too hard to find building polygon models anymore. Um, and if you just take those polygon models and you overlay them on top of this um, digital canopy model, you can apply a tool called zonal statistics that says of all of the pixels within my polygon, what's the maximum value or what's the mean value? And so if you take the average value of all of the elevation points from a CSM or sorry, a DCM uh, within that um, within that polygon, you can guess the height of that building pretty well. Now, that only really applies if the height of that building is relatively even. Sometimes it's not. Um, a lot of times sort of big industrial buildings have flat-ish roofs, um, so this is an okay way. Uh, obviously for things like houses, it doesn't work so well and you've got to use more sophisticated methods, but it's sort of an interesting first cut. I just need to kind of create a 3D environment. Um, it's really, really easy to do that. Uh, and uh, one of the notebooks um, will teach you how to do this on the technical side. So uh, that wraps up our lecture on um, sort of uh, some of the products and uh, associated with, with LiDAR data. Uh, we've got one more lecture to go. Uh, if you have questions on this material, of course, send me an email. I'm happy to answer anything. Uh, but until then, we will see you next time. Thanks for listening.